Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 113. David March, hunting saved my life. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Dr. Carl Miller, and you're listening to my favorite hunting podcast on the internet, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Hey, this is Matt Duff. And Jeff Danker. We're Major League Bow Hunter, and you're listening to the best podcast on the internet, the Big Buck Registry. Hi, I'm Tim Burnett with Solo Hunter, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm Jay Scott, and I'm here with my good friend, Dusty Phillips. Dusty, what's going on? Oh, man, another great episode of the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast coming up here, and I'm super excited, Jay. I am pumped up, brother. It's uh, We're going to talk to a fellow by the name of David March from March's Outdoor Adventures. And uh, just, it's a fascinating story. You, you know, we've had some interesting stories where you, you know, people were coming out of one lifestyle and going to another of the great outdoors as we just absolutely adore and appreciate. One that comes to mind is Crystal Buskirk, where she was an anti hunter turned into a hardcore hunter. That was an interesting story. Now we've got David March, who spent some time as uh, he describes the, his life li- growing up in the inner city and uh, actually got shot, um, and that changed his life and then sought out a life in the outdoors and the country from then on. And I think that's the power of good living. Being yeah, Absolutely. you know, and It goes to show you that uh, just because... You may be living the lights of a big city on the streets. You can still go hunting and become an outdoors man or woman. Right, exactly. It doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, but living this style of uh, this, it's a better lifestyle. I think when it's when it comes down to it, it's it's healthier. Um, it's better for you. It's more rewarding. It gives back to people and to the to nature and c- conservation more so than pretty much any other way of life. So if you don't have it in your life, I don't think it's you're fulfilled in some way. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but that's just the way I see it. Yeah, it's uh, it's something that you, you can pass this along, and you can change somebody's life by introducing them into the outdoors. Right, and the, and the outdoors certainly changed David's life, and David's going to tell us his entire story about how that happened. And before we get into that story with David, though, I do want to share... Uh, we had a, a donation this week, and I wanted to say thank you to Shauna Hoffman. Shauna, thank you so much for tuning into the show and supporting our efforts at the Big Buck Registry. Um, but before we get to David, I want to say thank you to everybody who has donated to the cause at the Big Buck Registry. We can't do this show without you. We have bills to pay, and it costs money to keep the show going, to be quite honest. And it's all been coming out of our pocket until recently, actually. We now have enough followers uh, donating to the cause through the the pledge page or the donation page we're actually able to sustain this a little bit but man we can always use more help so if you'd like to pledge or donate go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge or bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate so dusty what do you say we get david march from march's outdoor adventures on the line let's do it David March, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. How's it going, David? Uh, it's going real good, man. It's an honor. I appreciate you having me on today. We're, we're very excited to have you on. I've been following you a little bit on Facebook. Not creeping like Facebook, but just kind of following <laughs> you. Yeah, and like a, Not like a stalker or anything. Yeah, like. not like a stalker kind of thing, I have to admit. <laughs> Although I've been accused of that by some friends of ours. But that, no, I'm not doing that this time. <laughs> Uh, I thank you. I appreciate it. I, I, thank I, you for I, support. I appreciate what you do, and I can the the message that you're sending and the things that I see uh, are clear that you're an outdoor person and that you are 100 yeah. percent behind 
hunting, fishing, and just uh, enjoying the great outdoors and sharing that yes. passion with kids and anybody and everybody you can introduce to the sport. Exactly. Am, am I that, reading that right? That's my line. That's yes, sir, right. you are. Excellent. Uh, David, where are you from? I'm, I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, moved to Columbus in 1997, Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Cap City. Gotcha. And and uh, what was life like growing up? Oh, man. Well, kind of surprising. I'm the exact opposite of what I used to be. Um, Interesting. I was. I, I was that, that guy, um, to put it in a soft way, that when you rolled down the street, you locked your doors. <laughs> really? <laughs> Real quick. Yeah. I, I was the mean guy. I was a not-so-nice person. So, But that just come from uh, living in the wrong side of town and just having a hard life and had to do what I had to do to get by. Um, gotcha. But, but becoming a part of but you know, having a growing family, having kids, and um, getting in the church um, is what I can attest my turnaround to. Okay, and that's that's on everything I love. How would you describe that that life growing up? Was it uh, just a city kind of life, or was it a just uh, just hanging out with the wrong crowd kind of thing? It, it was an inner city okay. uh, type of crowd. Um, I was the middle child, so I had two above me and two below me. Um, Mom didn't work, but Dad worked at Lordstown, okay, up right outside of Niles, so didn't okay. have much time with him. So that type of thing. Gotcha. So, at what point did you decide that that's not where you wanted to be anymore? Uh, to be blunt, <laughs> yeah. To be when blunt. I got shot, yeah. When I got shot, and okay. um, when I, when my son, my when I started having kids, it's like okay, that's enough of that. Okay. And where did you want to take your life after you got shot? What was the what was the directive after that? Um, to try, just just trying to do right and leave a positive legacy for my kids, so that way they wouldn't have to go and do the things that I had to do or okay. live that lifestyle. So it sounds like you you did a one a one eighty. Just yeah. changed your Complete. life completely from inner city to the country, from yeah. hanging out with the wrong people to hanging out with the right people. Exactly. It's fascinating. My friends call me now a chocolate covered redneck. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that a little bit. Yeah, go, let's, let's get into that a little bit more. Why do they call you that? Um, chocolate covered redneck. Let's see here. <laughs> You name it, I do it. From from mudding to the Confederate flag to horseback riding, cow tipping, <laughs> hay rides, and you name it, I do it. <laughs> My best friends are duct tape and car. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, <You're done. laughs> so you got out of the inner city. You, you, yeah. you changed your life, and where did you go from there? I um, when, when I got out of the inner city, I. I like I said, I moved to Columbus and I lived in the suburbs okay. uh, in, here in Columbus with my dad. And when we got married, I, I started, that's when that real change started happening. Um, trying to find something better. So I stayed pretty close to the city, okay. but I got out to the country as much as I possibly could. Gotcha. And when, when you were growing up, was the country party life at all? Or is it just something? Yeah, that, um, actually. Actually, it was. Uh, my grandparents are from the Carolinas, okay. North and South Carolina. And on in back of their house, they had a couple, they had about two or three acres in the back of their house. They had a, a big old uh, garden, which we had to help tend. Uh, they had chickens and they had uh, pet coons, uh, raccoons in, at the house, too. So we had to tend to those. Okay, gotcha. Always saw squirrels and rabbits running around in the backyard. <laughs> so, so you always kind of had you had a, a, a little bit of influence in your life about living the country lifestyle compared to where you <laughs> were at that time. Yeah. And how old are you yeah. now, David? I am forty four. Forty four. All right, I can relate. I am also forty four. Forty four years young, you are. <laughs> that, that is correct. I am. I have been eight. I still feel like I've been. I'm eighteen since I was sixteen. That's what I tell everybody. Yeah, right. exactly. So I, I still feel very young and yeah, and spry, even though if I try to do too much the next day, I feel more of it the next day. But that's that's another story. I'm interested in you. So you you adopted a little bit of the outdoor life, and mm -hmm. it seems like you. I mean, you're into it now. You're that's that's your that's who you are. It's the way you live. 
Oh, yeah, wholeheartedly. When did you start to transition? What year was that? I started that transition, um, I want to say it was around 98, 99. Okay. Um, that's when my uncle invited me to go deer hunting with him. Interesting. And and being out there with my, my with my dad and my uncle, I, I remember the day like it was yesterday. I sat there and I looked around and I thought to myself, man, I was supposed to go out and get drunk last night, but I'd rather be out here yeah. <laughs> where it's peaceful. You know what I mean? Right. And that started that that started the change in that mindset. I get that. And it just and it just continued to grow. Let's talk about your uncle a little bit. He sounds like an interesting character. Okay. Oh yeah. So, t- what's his name? His name is Thomas. Thomas, and yeah, and and tell us about t- Thomas growing up. I mean, he he obviously had a little influence there on you. Um, is he? A, oh yeah, been a deer hunter for a long um, time. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He he got my dad into deer hunting. Um, um, my him and my dad both were military guys. They were they came out of Nam in like sixty, uh, like seventy and seventy one. Okay, um, is when they came out of Nam. So. Um, growing around them, I had that strict type of raising, but when we got older, he, you know, growing up, we went hunting all the time, hunting and fishing, but it was mostly for rabbits or squirrels or something like that. It wasn't until I got older when he introduced me to, uh, deer hunting hmm. and, uh, it, it started off in December, um, with gun season. And he told me the ins and outs about being quiet, being quiet and aimed. Um, paying for the heart and he, you know, he showed me where all that was and he just pretty much taught me the basics of deer hunting and started bow hunting in 2009 with a crossbow okay. and fell in love. Like, yes, I got to do this now. <laughs> Sounds like a good guy when it comes right down to Oh yeah, he is. He is. Nice. He's a really good guy. Where, where I haven't heard th- from him in a while, but uh, he's a good guy. Where, where do you think you would be if it wasn't for your uncle introducing you to what's out there in, in the woods? Where would I be? Yeah. Yeah, where where would you be if your uncle hadn't have taken you out hunting? <sighs> Man, um, I'll be honest with you. I'd probably be locked up or dead right about now. No kidding. Uh, I mean, I, I hate to hear that, but yeah. it's a great thing that your uncle took you out and, and introduced you into but, what he did. So, you know, what, what they what, what, how the old saying goes, you you. you you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Yeah, I agree to that. That, that That's very awesome. I'm, I'm proud of you myself, and I, I really don't know who you are. <laughs> I, I'm very proud. It's been, a, it's, it's been a great change, a big change. I'm so psyched you chose that path, David. I really am. It's, yeah, it's, it goes to show you what the outdoors can offer somebody that's not, not on the right path. Oh, yeah. So, David, knowing oh, yeah, what— and that's why I pushed it. I pushed the outdoors. And I, I'm not pushing it to the point where I'm shoving it down— someone's throat i'm just being open and honest and blunt with him like look it saved my life and it can do the same for you you know and our biggest thing is if you take our model is if you take a kid hunting or fishing you never have to hunt or fish for him in the street i agree to that that's a great motto to live by that is an excellent one uh, man I'm, I'm so glad that you're here that's just uh music to my ears i can't, I, I don't even know what to say to be honest and i don't get stumped very much but that's just it's 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 amazing Absolutely mind blowing, amazing. So, what's your mission today, David? Knowing what you know now about the power of living the outdoor lifestyle, what's what's your mission now? My mission now is to teach teach archery to as many young people and 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 get them to the outdoors as, as many as I can. Okay, and and help them see that there's more to life than the streets, and then and more to life than watching the stupid box. <laughs> The stupid box. All right. So who told you yeah. to call it that? Is that something you coined or where'd you first hear that? Well, term? I've heard people call it an idiot box before. Yeah. But the only thing that makes you an idiot for watching it is what you get out of it. Right. So I call it a stupid box because the more you sit and let your and not invest your time in something positive, it makes you that much more stupider. <laughs> While you sit back and watch everybody else doing something that you can be up doing yourself, but you decide to sit on the side mm-hmm. lines and watch it. Now, is it okay to watch hunting shows? Oh, absolutely. Please watch my show. Watch your show, exactly. <laughs> uh, David, I noticed that you went to a broadcasting school in Ohio, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Tell us about yes. that experience. Oh, man, that was great. That was in 2010. Uh, that was the Ohio Center, Ohio, Illinois Center for Broadcasting. Um, and that was an interesting um, how I came about doing that. Uh, I got diagnosed with epilepsy in 2004. I'm sorry, 2005. 
and I went and I started getting falling into depression because I didn't understand where the seizures and how everything was coming about. And I went and talked talk to a therapist and she, he told me, he said, well, Dave, why don't you, he was joking, jokingly doing this. He said, why don't you go out and do something that you like to do and get paid for it? Maybe that might help you relax a little bit. Mm. So it, it hit me. And that night I went home and discussed it with my wife and she said, huh, have you tried that? I was like, I don't know what to talk. I don't even know what that is. I don't even know where to go with that. So that next morning I saw a commercial for, uh, the Ohio Center for Broadcasting. And I said, I'm going to go check them out. So I went, checked them out, and I ended up, make a long story short, I ended up graduating the top of my class um, in there. Well, the second second to the top of my class, there's one guy above me. But doing that, I was the first student in, in school to have an intern while still in school. He worked for me as an intern in the field uh, filming, and I also broke lab hour records, so... That was pretty good. That was pretty good. And what was it again? You you did what with records? I'm sorry? Say say what you did you did again with records? Yeah, I broke uh, lab hour records. The most lab hours of all, um, interning. Oh, no they kidding. Took, uh, okay. How many hours you interned. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. And- so I did that. Um, but the, the thing about that year was that was the same year that my mom passed. Okay. So that was a, a deep year, a, a, a stressful year. It's not, that, that sounds stressful. Absolutely. And yeah. How did you get through it? How did I get through it? Yeah. I, sh- I shot a lot of bows <laughs> and a lot of arrows. <laughs> a lot. It is therapeutic. I-, I think, yeah, it is. It-, it really is. I was at the archery range at least three days out of the week right after school. And the thing about it is my wife understood and she supported it. So she yeah. said, whatever helps you relax. <laughs> she didn't like the-, the-, the fact that I had to go out and buy two new targets during that time. <laughs> <laughs> Because I just blew them out. <laughs> <laughs> nothing there's, wrong with there's that. Al- there's always one thing. I'll guarantee you this. There, there's always nothing between you and the target when you're out shooting a bow. <laughs> That's right. And that that clears your mind. And I'm I'm oh, like yeah. I'm falling with you where I can see where you're doing this to to free your mind of what's going on in your life, you know, and what you've been through. Right. It's amazing course that you've you've traveled down and got yourself where you are at today that, that's amazing man you you you've accomplished the world just by being in the outdoors and, and going through what you did with your mom and you know and it all come together in the end and it's like an amazing yeah. story that that you're telling there and i'm so involved because i can feel and understand where you've been and where you're going it's a passion uh, some guys at church they get they get irritated with me because when they ask me questions about hunting i start my passion shows for it, and I and I'm I'm starting to learn how to balance that with others, <laughs> but it's so hard to balance that and keep it to a minimum. <laughs> it really is. Right, right. David, you've had a, a very interesting past and path uh, to where you are today, and I'm so glad that the outdoors is such a major part of your life. But I'd like to get into a little bit of a little bit more of your hunting philosophy and strategies, okay. if we could. So tell us about okay. how you view hunting. What what do you think is important about hunting? Um, as I think the most important part is just getting out there, being able to get out there um, and see the, and see what God created. To me, that's the most important thing. Um, I, I give you an example. There's been times here in Ohio that I've sat on public land and watched deer walk by. I mean, some decent sized bucks walk by and just be amazed at the creation. Because for us, it's all about being out there. It's not always about the hunt. Like most people like to put emphasis on the keel or or the, or the, the the lung shot or the heart shot. Me, if I can get in my gorilla stand and go 20 feet up in the air and sit there while the sun comes up and not get anything, I'm happy. Right. I appreciate and that's being, that. That's the complete truth. <laughs> Absolutely it is. No, I get it. I, I mean, I love seeing some deer running around, too. That's that's pretty cool. But if it doesn't oh, happen, yeah, and, the, and as the light comes up and the the dew comes off of the grass, as the, you know, as the sun starts to hit it and the, the, the chill kind of starts to go away and the, the woods wakes up in front of your eyes and you're part of it, there's nothing more fulfilling, really, about right. Be, it's like somehow you feel like you're plugged in, and that you're part of it. And right. That's very fulfilling somehow. You get it. 
Yep. I get <laughs> it, man. It, exactly. I, yeah, I get it. I definitely get it. So let, let's talk about your strategies when you when you hunt. Yeah, yeah, we, I know you're a meat hunter okay. too, uh, but you've killed some nice deer, okay. nice bucks in particular. Um, how do you go? What's your style? What, what what do you do when you go hunting? What's the, the typical standard hunting setup or, or strategy that you use? Um, from you, you want to know from preseason to opening yeah. day? Yeah, or let's start day. about your. Yeah, let's start the uh, now. Like, wh- wh- where does your does your season start now? Or have you started it a while back in preparation? Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. My season has start. My season started uh, at the end of July, actually. Um, going out scouting, um, setting up trail cams, uh, looking for signs, trying to pattern the deer. It's right because public land is really hard. To do that on, so you gotta get out there early before everyone else does. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, working on cover scent, um, I'm really, I'm actually working on a formula right now for our own cover scent that's hopefully going to be productive. Um, that, but that's going to be a different topic. I'll share that with you later. Okay. Um, but I, I start working with my cover scent right now. Um, obviously, I'm shooting, practicing every day, getting my my daughters and my sons out to practice getting my, getting the crew together, getting the game plan together, um, getting mappings together right about now. And then, uh, come opening day, we have a, we have a, a ritual <laughs> where we don't shower for 24 hours. You don't it's shower for 24 thing. hours. All right. Tell me more about that one. Yeah. I haven't heard that yet. Why? <laughs> well, we got, we got the idea. We was watching, we were all sitting up watching the Duck dynasty one night and, we thought, you know, that might be a good idea. Let's try it. So we tried it last year mm-hmm. um, at opening day, and it wasn't it wasn't really as bad as we thought it was going to be. So we just said, okay, well, let's do it again this year. So we just start, kept it as a ritual. Okay, so it's just a ritual of, of sorts. Yeah. Does it make yeah. you a better hunter, or is it just a ritual? It's just a ritual. Okay. We still use our cover scent to keep down the body odor. Okay. Uh, but as far as using, like, like our cover, like our scent soap, Yep. I've been we've been using that religiously since July because okay. we want to make sure that our bodies are equipped with it or you know are already with it, yeah, on board with uh, the scent. Interesting. Now we say we. Who's we? You and the kids, or the, you, you and the, uh, the crew? Actually, me and the crew. The crew. Me and the crew. Right. Yeah, and, and that's only is uh, it's just like six of us total. Interesting. All right, so this is this is March's outdoor adventure crew that you're talking about here. Yeah. All right, let's talk yep. about the, the the marches at Outdoor Adventures a little bit. Who's on your crew? All right, we got uh, Jason Veselika. We got um, my daughter, Taylor March. Uh, she was out for the first time last year on her own with her bow up, up in the stand. She did very well. She wrote a blog about it, too, so I have to share that with you guys on Facebook. Um, and then you have Jay Allspaugh. You have Dwayne Seals. You have... Josh Scarberry, and then you have Eric Yorsky. And the thing about it is everyone that's on the crew has their own specific um, touch that they add to the show that they can bring to the table. All right. Now, are you making a television show that's on a, on a yes. station, or is this uh, something else? Um, we, we, we were pushing for to get picked up by a network. Okay. Uh, we were really trying to push hard for that. But it's hard finding sponsors to help cover that cost. Right. So right now we're just focusing on filming the videos, uh, putting them on DVD for the people, uh, so that way they can have something to remember their hunt by. Okay. And um, posting all of our videos that we have on YouTube. Gotcha. Let's talk about your crew a little bit more. Tell us about Jason. What's his? What does he add to the show? Jason. Jason is a survival specialist. He brings to the table a lot of survival skills, a lot of great ideas. Um, he is actually one of the ones that's helping make some of the ideas we have um, as far as uh, fabricating, like a camera arm. We have an idea for a camera arm. He's fabricating that. Um, he he He's our survival guy, our fabricator. Okay. And Taylor is your daughter. Um, tell us about Taylor. She She's the blogger and the designer. Okay. She did, she helped design the new the new logo that's about, that we're about to introduce. Um, she's also a writer and an artist, so she brings the artistic ability to it. Gotcha. And how about Jay? <clears throat> Jay Allspa. Wow. Jay is the computer guy. <laughs> okay. Um, I do most of the most of the web work uh, and social media. 
but he does the technical things on where how to keep us up to date on memory and that that type of thing. He also brings it to the to the table the business aspect of it. Gotcha. All right, and Dwayne. He's also our gun guy. He's our gun guy. Okay. All right. Uh, Dwayne. Dwayne. Dwayne is our Dwayne is our property guy, and he can sleep talk just about anybody to get us to let, let us hunt on the property. <laughs> I, I think I need a Dwayne in my life. That sounds like a good guy. That's a good guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. That's cool. And, jo- and Josh? He makes a mean, Dwayne makes a mean strawberry uh, cheesecake. Just okay. One to and he that. makes strawberry <laughs> cheesecake. That's a good one to know. Yeah. Nice. How about Josh? Uh, Josh is our, is our, is our waterfowl guy. Um, anything and everything about waterfowl, he, he's got it. Okay. He's ready to go. And Eric. Eric Yorsky is the manager. He's a, he's, he is a, she, uh, a vice president of a um, nationwide company here in, here in, based here in Ohio. So he brings the business side of it. Plus, he also brings the land side of it. He has land. Okay. So. All right. And you put this all together. Actually, it, to be honest with you, I, I didn't do anything. Just come up with the name and the concept, and everybody just fell into place. Gotcha. I Very prayed. Cool. I prayed one night and asked. I said, God, you know, please, if you if you want this to go forward, this is what you want me to do. Put people in my life that can help make this thing prosperous, and that's what he did. <laughs> all right. Very cool. Yeah, that's great. So, all right. Oh, wait. I got one yeah. more guy. Okay. One more guy. We and I just we just added him. Mm-hmm. And that is Michael Littleton okay. uh, out in Maryland. Okay, and, he's a good guy. And so you're you're spread out a little bit between Ohio and yep. Maryland. Actually, we're trying to reach out a little bit further, um, okay. and that deals with um, uh, a foundation that we're trying to get started. So, okay, that's where the other states come into. All right, good, uh, David. In particular, there's a, a deer hunt that I want you to take us on, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, it's, it's the deer from 2013, and I was wondering if you could take us with you on that journey as though it were playing out again today and maybe start about 48 hours before the hunt. And I'd like to have Dusty be kind of our, our guide to kind of walk you through okay. that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, now that, that's the, is that the buck hunt or the, uh, the, the, the doe stock? That's the, the buck hunt. But if you have a doe stock the with, that you want to add in about that after that, we'd love to hear that story too. Okay. Uh, well, that was a couple of days. The doe stock was a couple of days after. All right. Let's start um, with the buck story. Let's start with the buck story. The where, buck where, story. Where, where are we headed, David? Are we in Ohio? Yeah, I was here in Ohio, Franklin County. Public ground or private? It was private. Nice. Tell us a little bit about your uh, camouflage. Uh, I had mossy oak on that day. Mossy oak. Um, and it, it was kind of weird because I woke up that the, a couple of days before and I had my real tree stuff out because of the, the area I was hunting at. A couple of days before, it was public land um, on the south end of Franklin County, where that type of camouflage would, you know, obviously would work better. But I just felt like wearing uh, mossy oak that day. No kidding, mossy. So I slipped it on. Yeah, <laughs> it was kind of chilly. Out. You, you brought it was us starting up. to snow that day. I want to What's touch. Some, I want to touch on something real quick. So you're saying that if you go to a different edge of the county, you switch camouflages? Yep. Really? Okay. Explain that. Yeah, you, I do. Um, because of my, the area I'm, I'm speaking of in particular is 665. The state route 665 is where uh, is, in, is the public land area. In that particular area where we hunt at, the trees are a little bit different. The sun comes through uh, just a little bit different. So it casts a, the lighting is just a little bit different there, and the atmosphere is just a little bit different. Okay. Um, so you, whereas, adjust, you, know, you adjust to that. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Okay, it makes sense. Yeah, okay. Carry on. You had mossy oak camouflage on? <laughs> What are we? Uh, are, yeah. Are we bow hunting or are we rifle hunting or shotgun hunting? We're bow hunting. We're bow, bow hunting. hunting. Tell us a little bit about yeah. your bow setup. Um, I have a Hoyt. I've been shooting Hoyt since 2010. Are you still um, with Hoyt then? Oh Today? yeah, I'm still with Hoyt. Very still nice. With Hoyt. Hoyt Charger. Very nice. The way I see it is, you know, you got these guys that spend like thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars on their bow, and hey, if you got it, do it. But my bow does the same thing that one does, and that's put an arrow right through the kisser and right. done. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
It ain't about, it, it's not you know? about how much you spend on a boat. That, that's a fact. That, exactly. You know, I, I, I'm living proof of that. I, I, I tried something <laughs> different myself, and I went on the cheap side just to see what the results were. Well, it, it's amazing. It really is. Uh, I'm getting the same, if not better, results out of a low-end bow than I am a high-end bow. Uh, exactly. You know, it, it may take a little bit more tuning to get that uh, particularly sighted in and, and deadly accurate like I like it. But once I got it adjusted out and got the right things set up on it, it's amazing what a low end bow can do, really. But uh, oh yeah, so we're going on a bow. Oh, yeah. are, we in, are we in a ground blind or are we in a tree stand? Actually, I'm I'm out in the open on the ground. No okay. Um, so we're sitting, grounding, sitting. We're grounding and pounding, huh? Oh yeah, I'm sitting up. Actually, my back is up against a barn, a, uh, like a pole barn type deal. Okay. And uh, I've seen this buck and a bigger one come out um, several times within the the, the the couple weeks before this. And this particular night. Um, one of the guys there, he goes to my church as well. He had shot and missed a, uh, the big buck, the 10 point that was there. Um, he, he, he barely grazed it. And we searched like the 48 hours prior to my hunt, we searched all over the place for that buck and no blood, no arrow, nothing. So we couldn't find it. Uh, but luckily within a couple months, I, um, I seen the buck again come out. So he's still alive. Uh, I've seen him back here in the spring, back here in May, that big 10 point, and uh, he's still around. So that's a good thing. Yeah, very good. Tell, tell us a little bit about yeah. uh, you're, you're up against the barn. And what, what, are yep. you looking, what are you looking out into? Uh, open field? Tell us a little bit about the surroundings of the barn. Um, I have maybe a 30-yard shot in front of me to a tree line. It's a really close spot. It's like one of those once in a lifetime buck comes through, deer comes through, you take your shot, you go home, type, get in, get out, type deal. Um, no lingering around. It's open, very open. Okay, it's so, more like a yard. Right. So, <laughs> so you're sitting on the back side of this barn. I'm assuming it's the back side of the barn. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay, so you're sitting on the back side of this barn and you're looking out at 30 yards of the tree line. Is that the property line to somebody else's land? No, that's the, no, that's just where the tree line is. On the other okay. side of that is a pond. Okay. And okay. then that's when it, when it becomes into someone else's land. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It makes uh, sense. All right. I'm just trying to get a feel for the area. So we got our yeah. mossy oak on. We're setting up against the barn. And it's going to be a unique story because you're out in the open. And uh, Yeah. And it's getting chilly. It's starting to get chilly out. What, what time of year was it? It was in the fall. Um, I'm thinking it was about November because it just started snowing. Okay. So we're getting in a little bit of snowy night or snow and and the ruts, is the rut just kicking off, or is it already set in? Uh, the, the rut is in, and it's starting the rut's to calm. On? Yeah, mm-hmm. and this story's getting better and better by the by every second that you talk, David. <laughs> and so, it's so got the whole on, hunt. And, go ahead. I, I want to hear this. We're on the barn. we got our mossy oak on. We're at a 30-yard yep. shot to the tree line. Let's get into 48 hours prior to the hunt and hear the story. Yeah. Uh, well, the 48 hours, we've seen, I, 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 I seen the deer, uh, like I said, we were track. We tracked his deer twenty forty eight hours prior to that, and so I seen the um, the eight point come out, and I was like, "Ooh, I want to get him." And the guy said, "Well, shoot, just come on back. You can get him." All right, cool, <laughs> thanks. So I come back uh, that night, that afternoon rather, and I sat for about two or three hours, seen some does come out and start snowing. As you can see in the picture, it was snow on the ground. So I, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and I got like twenty minutes left of daylight. And I looked to my right, and I had put a tarp up over my head because I didn't want to get snowed on and have to keep wiping my face to get the snow off. So when I did that, I thought I was busted by the does, but I wasn't. And the buck come out right to the top of this little knoll right in front of me, 25-yard shot. And I'm thinking, if I heart shot it, he's going to run. Because um, I use the uh, raised two blades. I said, he's going to run about 20 yards. But if I neck shot it, he's going to bleed out really quick and lay there. So I took my chances and heart shot at him, and he ran 15 yards away and then took a jump down inside the woods. And now I'm, like, really, really freaking out because if he goes into the woods, he has a good chance of going over to the other guy's property. Well, the other guy doesn't like the guy's property that I'm on. They uh, one got of them a little bit of a beef huh? going on. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. So, right, carry on, carry on. I'm into this story. So as I, as I jumped up, I'm thinking, okay, give it about five, ten minutes. Let's see. Because I'm sitting there watching them. 
staggered. Blood just squirting out everywhere. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, just give it a few more minutes. He's going to drop. He's going to drop. He didn't drop. He disappeared inside the woods. And now I'm like really freaking out. I'm thinking he's over on the other property now. So I jump up and I take my time. I start tracking the blood. I step inside the woods and I got my little headlamp on <clears throat> and I see him standing there panting. He looks right at me. He leans up against the tree and blood is just pouring out. So I'm like, oh no, I just spooked him. He's going to take off and I lose his buck. And I back out. I sit in the snow. Now I'm soaking wet because <laughs> I'm sitting in the snow waiting for this deer to die. And then I hear something crash and I get up. I walk over and there he is all bled out. All mine. No kidding. No kidding. It was wow. uh, everything took less than 15 minutes. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. So how, how'd you get this buck out of the woods? I actually drug it out. Um, I drug it out. I actually, I went and I let him lay for a few minutes just to make sure he was, he had expired. Right. And I went back and got some help. I went and got my son. Uh, you seen the picture he was in there with me. Right. Um, he, I think he was like 10 in that picture. Yeah. He was 10 in that picture. He just turned 10. So I, I ran and got him. And uh, he did the best he could. He he carried the bow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he I was out up. there. He was out there. It's all that matters, right? That's right. He's seen it. He he cried like a baby too. Okay. He cried like a big baby. <laughs> He's like, my dad got a buck this year. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool, man. So uh, he was he was excited also then. Yeah, he was real excited. Uh, he loved going out with me. Um, he he would rather go and watch me hunt than actually hunt himself. So, okay. which I don't mind that as long as he's out there and I know where he is. Right. Absolutely. So, uh, uh how, I, how do you, so uh, when, when I got him out, when I went and got him to drag him out, I hooked up, uh, something a friend of mine gave me, uh, from the deer and turkey expo here in Columbus. It's called the, uh, leg cuff. I don't know if you guys ever heard of it or not. And, uh, I drug him out with those and it was easy. It was simple. I drug him right up to the top of the knoll, right back out into the back of the pole barn and, uh, the guy who shot at the tent point just happened to be there that night in his truck, and he, we loaded it up on the back of the truck and brought it on home. No kidding. So uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the leg hole drag. Is that is that the, uh, the the drag that actually clamps around the legs and you and you hook onto it that way? Yeah. It's called the leg cuff. It's really it's really cool. The leg cuff. Is that, did I hear you right on that? The, yes, leg cuffs. Okay. Like handcuffs, yeah. but... But the right, cuff. the leg cuff. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's something that uh, Jay. Have you ever heard of the leg cuffs? I have not, but I'm uh, very interested in that now. Sounds very. Oh yeah, check them out on Facebook, man. There, it's a really, it's a really good idea. Leg cuffs. All right. Yeah, check that out. I think I've seen it at the uh, at the Ohio Deer and Turkey Expo this past year. I was up there, and I'm pretty sure I ran. Oh yeah, it, guys. Yep, he was there. Oh dang. Yeah, small world, ain't it? Oh yeah. So the ultimate question: How did this buck taste? Oh man. I don't know if you guys seen the picture or not, but I that later on that spring I made steaks, and oh my word, it was the best in steak. Mm -hmm. I think it was. I think it tasted better than the doles previously because that was the first buck I've gotten in three years, so it tasted really good. I swear they always taste better when they got antlers. <laughs> Oh, yeah. gotcha. you know, after <laughs> after that head comes off and we get a process, I can't tell. I I can tell the difference a little bit. But it all goes down the same. <laughs> oh, right. I agree to that. So well, tell us, what's your favorite way to cook venison? Mine is, I actually use, uh, I have another uh, friend of mine out of Louisiana. His name is Papa Scott, and he has this Cajun seasoning. Most people just sprinkle it on and cook. I use it as a rub. Uh, my wife, though, she makes the best venison spaghetti, the best. Yep. No, maybe what, what, maybe one day if we get a chance to hook up, I'll, I'll see if she can make you some. Yeah, I was just getting ready to ask when uh, you have to just give me a heads up next time. Columbus is only about forty five minutes from my place, so I'll be there for a venison oh, spaghetti. Now you you're, you guys are out in Dayton, right? I'm a little bit southwest of Dayton. South way southwest. I, I tell you what, I can I can bring you some. <laughs> oh man, and get some made. Now this is venison <laughs> spaghetti. Mm -hmm. like... Oh yeah, it's the best. All right, it's so the best. she makes the best. How far will you travel? <laughs> I will travel. Uh, in the state, I'll, I will travel anywhere all over, over Ohio. That ain't helping Jay out much. That's not helping me out much, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I got uh, the pens. I can go uh, within a day's job, day's drive. Have you ever mailed spaghetti? Yes. 
<laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> I think there's laws against that. <laughs> yeah, that probably isn't. Probably breaking some multiple state law or something. Um, oh, um, man, that's a, that's a great story. And I, I can't wait to get to Ohio this year and try out some venison spaghetti, dude. This is – that just yeah. – all right. Awesome. So, David, where do you want to take – this whole adventure you have marches outdoor adventures what's the mission the mission for Mar- marches outdoor adventures buddy i tell you is to just to spread spread the positivity there's the positiveness if that is a word i'm, I'm gonna coin that phrase the positiveness of the outdoors and the, the positivity that you can get out of it to as many kids as possible um and not just the kids, but to those that have never tried it, that want to try it, getting them out there. That's our mission, getting them out there, just to try it once. Gotcha. And if you like it, cool. If you don't, it's no biggie. It ain't for everybody. And what do you have any other projects going on that that uh, are connected to your outdoor adventure yeah. uh, group that you think is, is doing that for you? Oh, yeah. Um, actually, actually what we're doing right now is, uh, we're trying to get a foundation started, like I mentioned earlier, and that's where, uh, Michael Littleton comes in out in Maryland. Uh, he's starting, he, he just got on board with us and he's helping out with the, with our foundation and it's called, um, excuse me, it's called Helping Tomorrow's Hunters Today. And what that, what we do with that is, is set up along the same lines as the Toys for Tots thing. Okay. Um, and we're starting to make it a multi-state, um, area where we could we take collection of gently used hunting items camping items fishing items clothes archery equipment fishing equipment camping equipment you know gently used items that we can help someone within our neighborhood that wants to try hunting someone within our our group or someone within um our little network of people um, or like, say, if you got a, a, a single mother uh, that gets a hold of us and say, hey, look, my son needs that that outdoor, that manly role model because his father isn't in his life. Okay, well, yeah, here. Here's our number. Get in contact with us. We'll take him out there hunting with us, and, you know, we'll spend time with him um, or him or her out in the woods and get them to that point where, you know, hey, there is hope, you know, just because. I don't have a father figure in my life. You know, there is someone here that actually cares and I'm learning from this person. And that's, that's the the whole goal of the foundation right there. Gotcha. That's awesome. That's a very, very important and cool foundation. I like that a lot. Um, thank you, Dave. What, what, if you had like one hunting tip to share with everybody, what would that one number one tip be? Number one tip. And this is coming from, um, a personal experience that if you hunt from a tree stand, wear your safety harness. Yes, that's a good one. My my dad fell out uh, a couple of years ago from 25 feet up and broke three vertebrae in his back. Ouch. Yeah, and they told him that he was going to be in that in that, that half body cast, uh, well, that, that, that mid-torsal yep. brace cast thing for three weeks. But, you know, we believe in the power of prayer and healing, so. He was actually, well, he was going to be in there for three months. He was only in it for three weeks. Gotcha. So, okay. And he survived. So as well, you can see, church and church in Christ plays a big part of our lives as well. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that. And that's, um, I think it gives you inspiration and keeps you going. Absolutely. I get it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. A lot of hope. So if, uh, if you had, do you, do you use, uh, do you read books and magazines to obtain oh, knowledge? Yeah. If you had like one, oh, yeah. one I, I, if you had one hunting book, what would it be uh, that you look to other than the Bible that uh, gives other you other than the Bible? Other than yeah, that gives you insight into how to hunt better. Um, Mr. Whitetail himself has a series of books out, uh, uh, explaining the, the the characteristics of whitetails and you know their 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 day to day lives. As you know, we're all they're creatures of habits, so it gives an in depth look. Uh, his, all of his books do. Um, uh, Mr. White, Mr. Whitetail himself. Uh, he has those books out um, online, and they give a complete detailed look into a whitetail deer's life. Gotcha. Okay. I've learned a lot from that. Learned a lot from that. Nice. That and Jimmy Sight. Jimmy Sight's out of um, yep. he's out of Michigan. Yep. Yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. And if you had one thing, the one thing 
that drives you crazy if you leave it in the truck, other than your firearm, of course, or, or weapon, that you left in the truck and you you wish you had it in the bag? What's that one thing that drives you nuts if you don't have it with you? My release. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. That's yeah. That's, that's kind of important. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Everything else I can survive with. So, David, <laughs> what would the David today, the 44-year-old David, tell the 22-year-old David March? What would I tell a 22-year-old David March? Knowing what you know today. I would tell him to think twice before making decisions and to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Gotcha. Good one. Very, very cool. That was a great, that, that was a great thing to tell the David at 22. Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> Which I would have learned. I wish I had that now. Well, had that then. Would I know now? Right, David. I got to say, this has been a pleasure. Um, I, I didn't know the, a, a lot of your backstory, and it kind of blew me away. I have to be honest. And uh, thank you so much for just spilling your guts and just telling us who you are. I think that meant a lot, and I really, really appreciate that you appreciate the outdoors as much as we do here on the Big Buck Podcast. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story. It's, 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 it's an honor. It really is. Very cool. Thank you. i got to be honest. I did not know David's complete backstory when he said that he probably today would be either dead or in jail and that living the outdoor lifestyle saved his life. It's amazing, isn't it? It's, I mean, I, that's kind of what I always believed, but now I've got somebody that I respect actually saying that and kind of confessing that, yes, the outdoor lifestyle is the way to go. It's, uh, and I believe him. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I 100% believe him, too. And, and just to listen to the story that he told and how his life unraveled and where he's at today with the outdoors, it, it goes to show you that... Uh, for, for one, you can you can live a different lifestyle and convert over into the hunting lifestyle. And for two, it, it seems to make somebody that's maybe struggling in life really make a change for the better for themselves. Right. Yep. Man, David, God bless you, brother, because that is awesome. It's, it's just really cool. Amazing what you're doing and the direction you're taking. Everything. I, I'm, you've got a, you've got supporters over here. So. Keep up the great work. Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week this week? We do have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. All right, throw it at me, brother. What do you got? You know, an often mistake that a lot of hunters make, and, and, and I'm guilty of it myself back, let's say, in the 2000s, 2001 era, is that if, if you're pulling up to a property that you're going to hunt and, and you walk back to your tree stand, and you climb up your tree stand, you can see your vehicle sitting out by the road or out in the field or out in the parking spot that you pull into, maybe you ought to consider to, to find a place that your vehicle is out of sight of where your deer may be traveling. That's a, a common mistake that you park your vehicle and advertise that you're there hunting. The deer pick up on that. Right. They know when you're there. They see your tree. They see your vehicle out the road. They know something's different. So just take that in consideration. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't really notice that that would, was the case, but I think you're right. I think they do start to figure that stuff out. They're not stupid. And that's the Chubby Times tip of the week, Jay. Love it, man. Excellent. Well, Dusty, where can we find you when you're not here chatting it up with me on the microphone? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Gobbler. Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Submit your photos over there. We'd love to see the buck that you harvested or you're after. You can trail camera pictures, uh, harvest pictures, anything you want to send in, and we'll talk about it. You can also find me on Instagram at Chasing Antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Sure, man. We can. Uh, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com. Actually, you can also reach Dusty there at dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. Uh, you can find us on the Outdoor Podcast channel now, and that's at outdoorpodcastchannel.com and on iTunes. And uh, if you're an outdoor podcaster or a thriving outdoor podcaster or wanna, want to be a outdoor podcaster and trying to figure it out, we're here to help and uh, just uh, – Shoot us an email, admin at outdoorpodcastchannel.com, and we can get you some help if you need help getting your show off the ground. Or if you have one that's starting to get going and you need some exposure, we can put you on that channel. Uh, there is a cost, but it is a great place to go because we are getting a ton of downloads and we have a ton of content with different types of shows. If you'd like to check us out at Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash big buck registry. Twitter is twitter.com forward slash big buck registry. If you have a beautiful deer and a big buck that you'd like to share to the world and you want to be famous for at least one day, uh, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck 
you can always give us a call at 724-613-2825. And please, 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 if you're an iTunes user, please go to the search bar and type in Big Buck Registry and then find the review section and leave us a five-star review if you love the show. And, of course, if you love the show so much that you'd like to help us pay the bills and keep this show alive and get all the great guests and knowledge that we possibly can and share it with you and the rest of the world who also want to hunt, Go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate or bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. I think that's about it, Dusty. Did I miss anything? Yeah, Jay, we're also naming your buck. Yes, we are. We are still running the fifty nine ninety nine special. Dusty will name your buck for you. Send in a picture and let us know that you would like for me to name it. We'll send you out our PayPal account and we'll get your buck name and we will actually call you on a live recording and That's tell right. you the name that I come up with for your buck. That's right. Well, you will be a guest on our show and we'll name the buck for you right here on the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Well, I'm Dusty Phillips. And I'm Jay Scott. And this is another great episode of the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.